you know, back in the dot com bubble, when the economy was the hottest it's ever been in my lifetime, the unemployment rate was 3.9% in 2000. Now it's at 4.1, and the Fed is cutting rates. That's insanity. That's it's absolute insanity. It doesn't make any sense. It's going to be a lot like the 1970s in the U.S., where we had high inflation, high commodity prices, and low prices of financial assets. I think you'll see bond yields go up significantly, and stock valuations will go down. Um, so talk, let's talk about debt monetization for a second, um, because that's ultimately the end game for gold, right? That's when gold goes completely parabolic to 10,000. It goes bananas. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and of course, your host of this channel. And I'm really looking forward to catching with a good friend of the podcast, Jared Dillion. He's the author of The Daily Dirt Nap, a book author. I think he's published five books now and uh, his latest was a series of short stories. And I'm really looking forward to diving into or into the macro scenery with him because uh, he was on in May and uh, we didn't have a lot of hard data. The Fed was still reluctant to do anything. But now we've seen a Fed rate cut only in uh, mid-September. It's mid-October now. so But we're still 24 days away from the next Fed meeting. So we will have to catch up with him about what, what is happening. Where's the economy trending? What, do, what does he think the Fed will do next? And what is the impact? Should we even care all right and uh let's see what jared has to say about that but before i switch over to my guest hit that like and subscribe button it helps us out reach a wider audience we really appreciate it because i know 80 percent of you watching are not subscribed tremendously appreciate that thank you so much now without much further ado jared it is great to have you back on the program it's good to see you again hey good to be here thank you yeah, really looking forward to catching up. As I said uh, before hitting the record button, we got lots to talk uh, talk about. Uh, lo lots happening over the summer, surprisingly, uh, especially here in the early fall. Fed rate cut uh, announced, bigger than expected by many. Uh, did you expect 50 basis points? Let's start there. Uh, I did, actually. Um, the Fed panicked. Um, here's what's going on, okay? So the labor market has been weakening slightly. And the Fed has been watching this, and you know, obviously, they care about the labor market uh, for political reasons and other reasons. And they said, "Gosh, the unemployment rate is going up. Uh, Non-farm payrolls are pretty bad. Um, there must be something wrong with the economy." Except, my theory on this is is that this labor market weakness is really a function of normalization from what we had in the pandemic, and I'll explain. In the pandemic, we pumped $3 trillion into the economy and we created massive labor shortages. We had huge labor market distortions. Okay. Uh, you went into a restaurant, you couldn't get served, there were no people, stuff like that. So big labor shortages. Over a period of four years, those distortions have gotten less and less and less. And now we're approaching something more like a normal labor market that you would have in a normal economy, which means there is going to be some weakness. So we saw the unemployment rate go from 3.5 to 4.3. It came down to 4.2. It came down to 4.1. It's still very low by historical standards, but this tiny bit of labor market weakness has caused the Fed to panic and cut interest rates unnecessarily. Okay. They didn't need to so they didn't need to cut 25 basis points. I, I suppose you can make an argument that they could say, well, real rates were two and a half percent or more, and we need to get real rates down to one percent because monetary policy was restrictive. I don't think that's the case. I think the Fed cuts are a mistake, and inflation expectations never went away. Not only did they not go away, they're actually going up. And what's going to happen is the Fed is going to cut rates a bunch of times, uh, and it's going to cause another round of inflation in 2025 and 2026 possibly bigger than what we had before. That's a lot to digest there, Jerry. We need to go through that. We need to chew through it. And uh, maybe we'll start with the fact that you, you, you mentioned that uh, you didn't want to see a Fed rate cut or you didn't you don't think it was necessary. Why, why do you say that? Like, maybe let's elaborate on that. Like, why, why do you think a higher interest rate is OK for the economy? Well, you know, what's interesting is that when Paul Volcker raised rates to 14 percent, uh, it caused a massive recession in 1982. We had negative 6% GDP that year. It was a really terrible recession. When Powell raised rates 
same amount and actually faster, it did not cause a recession. We did not get, we didn't get much of a slowdown at all. The data softened a little bit in 2023, but we did not get a material slowdown, um, which means that the economy can tolerate higher rates, right? It can tolerate five and a half percent Fed funds. So um, also, you know, there's some other issues about whether hiking rates or lowering rates really even has an effect on the economy. I'm not sure it does anymore. The transmission mechanism is different than it was in the 80s. Um, but I think lowering rates was a mistake. Interesting. Like maybe to follow up and see if I can connect the dots here properly based on what you just said. So the labor market is normalizing, right? So we're going back to four, four and a half percent somewhere there, normalizing a uh, high, higher uh, unemployment rate. But and at the same time, you're saying the economy is strong. My question is now maybe as a follow up to that, is the economy strong because there's so much money being pumped into the system or was pumped into the system? So the higher interest rates will only be okay for a certain period of time until like the whole pig has gone through the python here. The pig has already gone through the python. Uh, it's already happened. So if you look at charts of uh, the stimulus that has been saved and then spent over time, pretty much all of that stimulus has been spent. Like there's really, there's no more stimulative impact from what happened in 2020. So, um, you know, it, the, the economy we have today looks a lot like what we had in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, you know, we had a we had a very strong payroll number last month. Uh, I guess it was this month. It was last week. And uh, I think it was 254,000 jobs. It was it was high. It was above the highest expectations. Uh, and you're going to see more of that. We the economy is not weak. OK, um, so. Yeah. Is that is that a function of overspending, like two trillion dollars of deficits in this year alone? Is is that why the economy is so strong, or is there underlying factors like let's let's say productivity growth or so due to AI boom? I'm just making things up here now, but like I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Jerry. I'm just trying to work out like where is that strength even coming from? Well, part of it is coming from government spending. You know, if you look at the jobs numbers, a huge percentage of new jobs are actually being created by the government. You've probably seen charts on that. So um, it's, a, it's enormous. I would say, just off the top of my head, I'd say two-thirds of new jobs are by the government. So the government stimulus is definitely having an effect. Um, you know, but also um, people have money and they're spending. They're traveling. They're staying in hotels. They're buying durable goods. They're buying cars. Um, you know, it's it, I, somebody recently called this the Bigfoot recession, right? Because... <laughs> Like it's this recession that we never see, you know, people keep predicting a recession and it never happens as the Bigfoot recession. So I actually, at the end of 2023, the data did get soft for a little while. We had some a, a run of weak data and I thought we would have a recession and I was wrong. And uh, I think, I, I think a recession has been postponed until at least well after the election. So yeah, like you, you mentioned recession by the end of the 2024 during our last conversation, but it seems it's getting pushed back. If, like every time we chat, like there's a next yeah. turn, not not your forecast, but just based on the economic data we received, GDP growth at 3%, contrary to Germany, it's actually growing. <laughs> um, are there, but are there any new data points or market movements that you're looking at that uh, either like sort of uh, cement your no recession forecast f for now? Or is there, do you see cracks in the data that might hint at a recession like in three to six months time or so? Is there uh, I don't see any cracks at all. No. Yeah. No. So you see unemployment rate, for example, like uh, I think Jerome Paul mentioned 4.4% um, sort of normalizing in that range. Is that something you would look at as well? Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, 4.1% unemployment is incredibly low. And the Fed panicked with unemployment at historically low levels. You know, back in the dot-com bubble, when the economy was the hottest it's ever been in my lifetime, the unemployment rate was 3.9% in 2000. Now it's at 4.1% and the Fed is cutting rates. That's insanity. That's It's absolute insanity. It doesn't make any sense. So... A lot of this has to do with politics. You know, I think that in the time leading up to an election, I think, you know, the fact that we might have job losses and the Fed is doing nothing about it, I think that I think that looks bad politically. I think that's embarrassing for the Fed. So I think that's driving most of their decision. 
maybe it's a follow-up to that. I was just looking at the Fed watch tool and uh, 87% roughly expect a 25 basis point cut, so a small cut, while 12% roughly say no cut, no cut at all. I would put you in the no cut camp. Is that uh, is that a fair assumption there, Jared? No, I believe they'll cut. I mean, there's a difference between what the Fed sh- should do and what they will do. And even though I believed that the Fed should not cut uh, last month, I I said that they would cut 50 basis points, right? So I think they'll cut 25 in November, and they'll probably cut 25 in December, although that's a little less certain. Um, it's possible that this rate cut cycle will last three Fed meetings, will be 100 basis points, and it'll be done. Um, I think that's very possible. Yeah, let, let's talk a bit about the effects, like a bit of the butterfly effect of uh, the, the rate cuts here. Like, how do you see that trickling down into the economy? How, how do you think our viewers will experience the rate cuts? Is there anything like that's blatantly obvious, or do we have to wait quite a while until it's visible? Well, the interesting thing is, is that at the last Fed meeting, when the Fed cut rates, it had the opposite effect of what was intended. Long term rates actually went up. Uh, The curve steepened, the yield curve steepened quite a bit. And the Fed cut 50 basis points and 10 year yields and bond yields went straight up. Uh, Tens have gone from like 3.6 to 4% in a couple of weeks. So the the Fed cutting rates has actually been counterproductive. You know, I actually I get I get a lot of questions from normal people, people not in the financial industry, and they're like, "Oh, the Fed's cutting rates. That means mortgage rates should go down." And I I, I say, "No, actually, mortgage rates are going to go up." And then they get really confused. So, <laughs> let's explain that one though. Like, uh, explain because new house applications. I've been looking at. That. I was been monitoring a little of the activity on on social media in particular. Instagram is quite interesting. Because uh, I get shown a lot of real estate ads on on uh, Instagram, and uh, it's quiet down a little bit, and uh, there's not as much buzz around the real estate market anymore. Is the, is the real estate market really cooling off? Uh, the real estate market, there's transactions are down, um, so you know overall activity is down, but prices are not down. Uh, prices are still high here. Prices are not coming down. Um, and if you want to talk about real estate, I you know I think the U.S. Is- is going to look like Canada and Australia in a couple of years. Uh, we have an acute housing shortage. We have lots of immigration, legal and illegal, and uh, we just we can't build houses fast enough to fulfill the need. So I see housing prices, you know, and I'm, I have a lot of confidence in this prediction. I see housing prices much higher in the next five to ten years. Yeah, I, I would actually concur because. There's too much demand. You still have a lot of immigration in the U.S. and there's not enough housing, yep. right? And we can debate about legal, illegal. That's uh, that's beside the point. But there's not enough housing, right? Um, there, there's a constant rumor that the Fed cut rates because of the looming U.S. debt crisis. Let's let's call it that. And uh, having the U.S. paying interest rates on on that debt, the uh, the Fed proactively lowered rates just maybe get ahead of it because a lot of the the bonds and t-bills have to be reissued renewed next year i I forgot the exact number i think it's 15 trillion that needs to be reissued next year might be wrong um would you see like as a political motivation and uh what are your thoughts on that um i don't want to say that's the the cause for the rate cuts but i think it's definitely a factor uh i think it's a factor um You know, the Fed has mismanaged its liabilities. Um, They have not issued enough bonds in 10s, 20s, and 30s, and they've issued too many bills. Uh, I want to say the average maturity of U.S. debt is like five or six years or something like that, and a huge amount of it is in bills. So, you know, the bills, they constantly have to roll, and bills are basically tied to Fed funds. So if you lower Fed funds, you're going to lower bill yields and you're going to reduce the cost of funding the government. Um, you know, this kind of goes back to Janet Yellen um, when she was Fed chair. She, you know, when rates were low, like basically at zero, she had the opportunity to roll out the debt to longer maturities and she didn't. And it was one of the biggest mistakes that you could possibly make. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to bring up a chart here in a second, Jared. It's like I'm curious, and you might have to explain it to to me and to our listeners. It's the let's hope I open the right one here. Yes, it is. Um, it's it's a ten year bond chart. It's nothing crazy, but if you could explain to us that last move right here was that rate cut, right? So 
that's when it turned around and just the the ten year yield just exploded. People, meaning people are dumping their bonds, their ten year bonds. Can you explain to us why that is happening? Is like is the bond market pressuring the Fed into keeping rates higher and uh, maybe even increasing rates? No, I mean, you have to understand the yield curve and how transformations of the yield curve work. I mean, basically what happened was the market said that the Fed cuts were a mistake. They're cutting rates into a strengthening economy, which is going to cause inflation, which makes long term bonds less attractive. Right. That's basically what happened. Um, I've been trading that. You know, I've been short the long end of the curve. It's it's been a great trade. Um, but that's what happened. Yeah, it looks like there's quite a bit of momentum left in it as well on that trade. Yep. It's it's a straight line up. Do, do you have a target? Like 4.3 looks like a first resistance here, 4.3% on the 10 years. Uh, and I I'm not a chartist, by the way. So Yeah, I think 10s are going to get to 4.5, 4.6, something like that. Wow. Okay. That's that's quite an impressive move from uh, from that level, right? Yeah. So, really interesting. Um, are, are you worried about that at all? Like looking at the bond market, we talked about rolling over debt next year. And I know we talked about that the Fed will actually have to monetize some of the US debt at some point. Uh, do, do you see a policy, policy shift happening anytime in the near future? Like next, I don't know, let's call it 12 months, perhaps? Um, so talk, let's talk about debt monetization for a second. Um, because that's ultimately the end game for gold, right? That's when gold goes completely parabolic to 10,000. It goes bananas. Um, the Fed isn't going to monetize the debt until the economy is in a lot of pain, until it becomes absolutely necessary, which means that long-term rates need to go a lot higher. Um, four and a half percent on tens isn't going to do it. You need to get tens out to like 7%. Um, so if you're getting sweaty palms waiting for the Fed to monetize debt, I can tell you that it's going to be several years from now. It's going to be many years before this happens. I think the probability of it happening eventually is 100%. I think it absolutely will happen in my lifetime, in your lifetime. Um, but it's going to be a while. So, yeah. Now, uh, I keep looking at that scenario, and it always scares me. I keep coming back to it. Maybe I sound like a broken radio or something like that. But I keep thinking of Japan. Right. Like I keep bringing it up in almost every conversation, but I'm trying to figure out like what that end game scenario looks like that you sort of mentioned. And uh, are we kicking the can down the road? Like a few years from now, if the Fed starts buying the U.S. debt, is that the Japan? Uh, ja let's call it the Japanese scenario. Um, it depends on the motivation. OK, um, you know, this has already happened. We did QE back in 2008. We did QE for a number of years which is essentially the same as debt monetization. It's the same thing, but the difference is the intent, right? The intent of quantitative easing was to increase inflation, which it sort of did, but only in asset prices. It did for stocks and bonds. Uh, it did not do anything about consumer goods. It did not create inflation in that. So we had a period of deflation or disinflation throughout most of the 2010s. Um, it's if you monetize debt because you want to bring down interest rates, that is a completely different intent. And this has been done, as you know, in the United States in the 1930s and early 1940s. Uh, the Fed was actually pegging the yield of the bond, co the, the long bond at 2%. And uh, when the peg was lifted, I think in 1945 or 1946, uh, there was actually a huge amount of inflation that resulted. Inflation got up to like 14 or 16 percent or something like that. So it's like I said, it's going to happen, but um, it, it's it's really academic at this point. Yeah, I think so as well. I'm just like I'm really trying to figure out because my biggest fear is like the, we've been sort of forecasting like a market crash and everybody's been calling for it, but it doesn't happen. And then I look at Japan is like is my biggest fear is that we keep forecasting something that's never going to happen. Right, that the economy could just like maybe we'll devalue the dollar, like the, we, the U.S. loses world reserve status at some point, not tomorrow. Don't get me wrong, like don't hit me in the comments. Not going to happen tomorrow, but we see tendencies on the BRICS countries of a second currency evolving, things like that. Like we're just going to see Japan 2.0. It's like I cannot shake that feeling. It's like, am I so far off, Jared? I know. It's like help, help me shake that feeling. Well, Japan is different from the U.S. and the U.S. is different from Japan. I mean, we have the world's reserve currency, so this may happen in 100 years. It might happen in 500 years. I don't know. Like this, yeah, okay. you know. <laughs> so 
Um, the one thing I will say is that uh, back in the 90s, you had the bond market vigilantes, right? And in 1994, when Bill Clinton uh, and Hillary Clinton proposed you know, basically socialized medicine, uh, the bond market freaked out and yields went up 2%. And the bond market, you know, there's that quote from James Carville. He said, you know, when I die, I want to be reincarnated as the bond market because you can intimidate everyone. That basically put aside the plans for Hillary care. So I am speculating that bond speculators will punish any president, any administration that tries to meaningfully increase the deficit even more than it already is. Uh, that's more likely to happen with Kamala Harris than with Trump. Um, I would not be surprised if Kamala Harris gets elected that you see a very rapid backup in yields. That might happen. Uh, we saw in 2022 that the bond market vigilantes are still around. Right. So that that could definitely happen. Since you brought up the U.S. election, it was one of my next questions. Might as well throw it in now. Let's uh, let's assume like w what happens. Like we have two choices: Kamala Harris, Donald Trump. We don't have to get political, but I'm curious. Like, w what do you expect to happen? Like, we got three weeks exactly from today. Um, I think it's three weeks. Yeah, three weeks roughly until the U.S. election. So, like, w what are your expectations in general? Uh, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, unpredictable things happen around the election, and elections are hard to predict. Um, I think that uh, right now the stock market is rallying. It, it broke out of a range on the day that Trump went to a 54% probability of winning uh, on the betting markets. So right now the stock market is rallying, I believe, because the stock market believes that Trump is going to be president. Um, probably rallies into election day if Trump wins. It probably sells off. There's a sell the news event. And who knows what happens after that? I think if Kamala were winning in the polls, I think you would see the stock market underperforming here. If she happens to pull it out on election day, uh, I think there is going to be a dramatic repricing in the stock market, um, 10% or more. So we'll see. Wow. That'd be a massive retracement. That'd be 500, 600 points almost. Yep. Like I have to admit, like I've said last week, the last 10 days, maybe on, 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 our, on our show here, that it looked like the S&P 500 was topping out a little bit, that it lost steam. But then you said it's like as well, and I'm looking at the chart here, it broke out yet again. It's like maybe we can sort of work out the triggers. You mentioned Trump jumping to 54 point, uh, 54% um, in, in the polls. Like are there any other, is there even a fundamental trigger for this rally? No, there really isn't. <laughs> uh, I mean, stocks are, you know, the funny thing is, is that I, I trade stocks a lot less than I trade other asset classes. Stocks are purely emotion, right? It's pure, it's purely sentiment. It's purely emotion. Um, and yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, it's like, I can't really find a trigger either, but I was looking at the chart like 10 days ago. And I was like, this is topping off. Like we're losing steam, but then we broke out again. So, um, Let's get to the commodity complex. Based on sort of what we discussed, let's uh, set the scene yet again. Like, no recession for now. That means, in my opinion, Dr. Copper and Copper should be doing quite well. It did, and now it, now it isn't. Um, let, let's talk about the commodity complex a little bit. Um, what, what is Dr. Copper telling us, for example, Jared? Well, Copper is trading uh, with the China stimulus, and it's basically trading 100% correlated to Chinese stocks. So Chinese stocks were up 25% in a week, which was remarkable. Uh, then there was a correction. They were down 9% in a day. Uh, they're still down. So copper is just tracking basically the likelihood of a China stimulus at this point. And that's all that's happening. Do you see more stimulus coming out of China, by the way? Like, let's break break that down. Like, how, how is that impacting copper? Like, what's the most impactful stimulus package here from out of China? Um. Well, I mean, the, the China's um, biggest policy tool is reserve requirements. You know, in the United States, reserve requirements have been constant at 10% for decades. We haven't touched them at all. Uh, <coughs> um, China messes with reserve requirements all the time. Reserve requirements have a huge impact on the economy. When they lower reserve requirements, it has a massive impact. Hence, stocks went up 25% in a week. So they could lower them more. Um, like I said, we don't do that here in the United States. Maybe we will someday, but. 
Yeah. Looking at this, let's call it distortion. Like it's an almost unfair meddling with the markets here, throwing that stimulus package around. Like how, how has that changed your outlook for the commodities? Like um, it's, uh, copper in particular, like do you still see a strong, you know, strong, what do you call it? Like a strong <laughs> fundamental basis for higher prices? Well, so first of all, I don't pay a lot of attention to copper, but commodities bottomed in August. It was basically a panic capitulation low in August. Commodities bottomed. I am comfortable saying that August was the low for commodities, only higher from here. And I think on a long-term basis, short-term, medium-term, and long-term, I think commodities are going higher. Um, I think we are. I think we're going to. Inflation is going to come back, and I think 2026, 27, 28, it's going to be a lot like the 1970s in the U.S., where we had high inflation, high commodity prices in low prices of financial assets. I think you'll see bond yields go up significantly and stock valuations will go down. Just to clarify, when you say commodities, what do you throw into the mix here? Like copper, obviously, is a part of the precious metals, ag commodities, oil, what, what's in that mix? It, literally everything, ag, <laughs> softs, metals, energy, the whole basket, yeah. The whole basket, okay, fair enough. I just wanted to clarify, because personally, I only look at the pretty much base metals, precious yeah. metals, mm -hmm. a bit of oil. I don't really follow the ag commodity, so I just uh, wanted to clarify for our audience as well. Jared, let's get to gold. Let's let's talk about gold. And uh, you called for $2,500 last time, roughly, and you saw the gold price moving there. We've surpassed that a long time ago. We're at uh, knocking at the door of 2700 again. Um, wh what do you make of it? Like, how, how do you see the current move? How sustainable is it? Where do you see it go? Well, the most recent high was 2680. Uh, we put in the 2680 high about a week ago. Uh, that's resistance for now. If we break above 2680, I mean, we have a clear shot to 3000 in gold. And depending on what happens with the election, we could get there in the next couple of months. It could happen very fast. Um, you know, trading an asset or a stock that's at its all time highs is kind of fun because it's very difficult to tell where resistance is. You know, like there is no resistance. You're at the all time highs. So I think plenty, plenty of room to run in gold up to 3000. I like it. I like it. Like what are some of the main drivers? Anything in particular or is just momentum driven? Momentum driven, but really it's really about inflation expectations and the likelihood that we'll have to monetize the debt. Um, but I think I think no matter who wins the election, gold goes up a lot. It probably goes up more if Kamala Harris gets elected. So, Yeah, no, I, I would tend to agree. It's, a, it's an interesting scenario. Um, any thoughts on silver, Jared? Everybody asks me about silver. <laughs> I don't. Silver is... <laughs> Silver just humiliates everybody all the time. Look, I actually, I read a really interesting piece on silver um, last week uh, by my friend Alex Campbell, who used to work at Bridgewater. And I think silver has the potential to outperform on industrial demand more than investment demand. Um, solar is creates a big demand for silver. And Mexico, Peru have not been producing silver at half the rate that they have in the past. You have this big solar demand. I think in a couple of years, we could have a huge supply deficit of silver. I think it's not priced in. So I'm super bullish, but it's impossible to trade. Yeah, it makes sense. Like 3250, I think is resistance once we break through that. And I'm curious uh, where things are headed. Cause same, same with gold. Like once momentum is there, we're, we're off to the races. And, yep. uh, really curious what that will look like. Um, Jared, shifting gears a little bit and uh, topics. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but one big topic of our last chat was the private equity bubble and uh, how, how you expect private equity to fall flat on its face at some point here. He's like, I'm curious, um, given what we just discussed, you still see that as a, as a, as a put, is, is that still possible? And uh, what does that look like right now? Uh, nothing really new with that. I mean, since the last time we talked, uh, the big publicly traded PE firms have gone higher, mostly due to lower interest rates. Now that interest rates are growing, going up, the stocks are actually going down again. Uh, I don't really have any change to the thesis. Um, I still think it's a massive bubble. Um, yeah, so it's um, it, it's got a lot of downside. What gets you excited these days, Jared? Like when you look, when you open your computer, you you turn on your terminal, you look at it. Like what gets you excited? This like what's something you check first thing in the morning? Uh, I check my book sales. 
Okay. I was going to get to that. Like you, you take it away. I was going to get to your book. I want to talk about your book, but uh, I was just going to say, like, what, where do you, how do you get your dopamine hits? Um, I, I guess, I guess, I guess I don't, I don't understand the question. <laughs> I mean, I look, I'm a trader. Like I love to trade. So it's, um, you know, I, I, where do you I, see opportunity for a win right now? Where do I see an opportunity for a win? I mean, honestly, probably in gold, you know, I've had a, I, I mean, look, I've, I've been long gold for the last 19 years. Uh, I have a core position and then I have a position that I trade around. Um, I traded it tactically. It's, you know, like I said, if we break above 2680, it's going to run like an antelope. So no, fantastic. No, so Jerry, let, let, let's get to your book because you just published Night Moves, uh, a series of short stories. Let, let's talk about it. Like what motivated you to write the book? What is it about? Tell us about it. Uh, it's a short story collection. Um, it is, I highly, highly recommend this book. And, you know, there's finance people listening to this podcast. Maybe they don't do a lot of pleasure, pleasure reading. Maybe they read finance and economics books all the time. I encourage you to take a break from the finance and economics books. Uh, this is literary fiction. It is uh, a type of fiction that you won't find anywhere else. Um, it is a self-published book. Uh, it's a very fancy book for a self-published book. Um, it is uh, it, the reviews uh, have been outstanding. Um, I did not pay people to write them. I only have one mom, so I don't have like 20 moms like writing <laughs> reviews. Uh, but out of 52 reviews so far, 50 of them have been five star. So people really, really like the book. No, fantastic. Awesome. Just give us a bit of a summary of like one of the short stories. What, what can we expect? I scroll through your Amazon uh, summary and I got stuck at uh, Sex and Death. <laughs> <laughs> well, the title, the title story, so there's 16 stories and the title story is called Night Moves. And it's about uh, a, a music producer who lives in Miami who's independently wealthy, inherited a lot of money. And uh, he develops a relationship with the mom next door who is married uh, and it kind of goes sideways and he has a DJ gig in Miami and uh, she goes there and it, you know, it's just, it kind of goes from there, but um, it's uh, there's, I mean, look, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty heavy read. There's a lot about substance abuse. There's a lot about mental illness. Uh, I would say, you know, out of the 16 stories, 13 or 14 are pretty dark um there are some uplifting ones so uh there's there's a story called 200 hours where you have a young couple and uh the guy is adamant that they will not have sex until they've spent 200 hours together mm -hmm. and then hilarity ensues it's kind of a romantic <laughs> comedy story so it's it's just really it's really good stuff so that sounds like an next Netflix movie. There, are you uh, you selling the script at all? Like, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> trying. Working on that. No, fantastic, yeah. Jared. Like, how, how can we follow you? How can we follow your work at Daily Dirt Nap? Obviously, yeah. Twitter at Daily Dirt Nap. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the Daily Dirt Nap, if you like the economic insights, uh, please go to DailyDirtNap.com and um, subscribe there. Also, uh, Jared Dillian Money is my personal finance company, right? It's my personal finance entity. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there. If you want to read about private equity, I have a website dedicated to the short private equity trade. It's called shortprivateequity.com. And we have like a 20 page white paper on why private equity is going to hell. And it is a very compelling read if you want the paper go to shortprivateequity.com. You'll see that it's a drudge style website with a bunch of links on private equity. And at the top, there's a link to the white paper. I highly recommend you go there. Fantastic. We'll definitely link to it down below. Yep. And uh, we'll, we'll make reference to it down below, of course. So really, Jared, really appreciate you making the time. It was a pleasure to catch up yet again here and uh, get get your insights. So everybody else, go go to uh, Daily Dirt Nap and uh, go go check out uh, Jared's Daily Letter as well. You, you publish daily, don't you? Yep, yep. Daily Economic Insights. Phenomenal. And uh, Jared, thank you so much. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate you watching. And uh, if you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously. Leave a comment. What do you think of the discussion? How are you positioning? How do you expect uh, the markets to play out over the next 
three months. Lots of macro events happening, of course, uh, globally, not just in the US. So let us know what your thoughts are. How are you positioned? We really do want to hear from you because we often read the comments and try to sort of incorporate them in our questions here. And uh, really appreciate uh, the Clear Commodity Network for syndicating our episodes. Go check out clearcommodity.com. Our friend Trevor Hall and Corey Flex set that up recently. And it's definitely worth checking out. It should be your first web page every morning to check out uh, market pricing and the latest podcasts around the commodity space. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots, lots more here on Swerve.